Let's pray and ask the Lord his blessings this morning. Father, uh, thank you for meeting us in a very, very special, redemptive, salvific way, Lord. You've come to us in the person and in the Son, Jesus Christ. Father, you did not only become our Emmanuel to come here on earth, but you came right into our hearts. And Lord, we, we bless you and we thank you for saving us, redeeming us, purchasing us. And Father, that, that very thing, that incarnation, we could turn around and send two families to one of the most dangerous cities in the world to proclaim that great news. And we could send another family into another continent where Islamic terrorists are bred, and yet the gospel goes right to the very heart of that. And so only that you can pull this. And so we thank you. Father God, we love you. We praise you this morning. Would you please, in a very deep, profound way, come to us this morning in and by your words. Tender our spirit this morning, tender our hearts cause us toward the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021 to look to you for everything, for you are our everything. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen and amen. Well, 2020 has obviously been a surprise. A week, a year ago, exactly this week, America had already published its New Year's resolution here for 2020. Here they are. Eat more of my favorite foods, lose weight and diet, go to the gym, be happier, better mental health, be more healthy, be a better person, upgrade my technology, And I think this is probably the most prophetic, staying motivated. No one knew in any way what was going to be handed to us. First, the pandemic do out the apprehension and the fear and the panic. And then as we watch spring and summer and fall go by, trying to learn and put up with what's called the new norm, We were together, yet alone. I think for the first time in my entire life, I have we have ever celebrated Easter by ourselves at home. It was weird and it was strange. Many have expressed how they were the longest days of their life, and yet they felt the year just flew by. What began to be together turned into this uncertainty of global pandemic. And then along came the protest, turned riots, evolved into looting and the outcry of social injustice. Some of our cities shut down. Streets became a war zone. Sites of boarded up buildings and storefronts. It prepared us for the long haul. It divided a nation that was already feeling an emotional and physical and a mental fatigue. If that wasn't enough, it was a a year of the most hated election year. It became degrading, nasty in politics. Family and friends were divided over this political tribal that started rearing its ugly head. Politics took on a new form of religious identity. 
then all the conspiracy theories and came out on an unrestrained way like a wildfire. Then came the contested election. Now that COVID-19 started to spike again, a new administration is coming on, the uncertainty of it all. We're told domestic violence, suicide, alcohol, drug use, all of that is on the spike. They needed those who were weak in these areas, needed to stay sober. They needed the community to be with, but there was no community for them. My question in all this for us this morning, as we say goodbye to 2020 and, and, and embrace 2021 is, where is the church in all this? Where is the church? Truly, it's been an hour of testing that was handed to us. If our community, if our country, if our nation ever needed the church to be the church, it is here and now. For the first time in this generation, actually, unbelievers are asking serious questions. The conversations we're having. And so I really believe with all my heart This is a gift from God to the church. Some of you remember old enough, Wayne Watson's song for such a time as this comes from Esther 4.14. And in it, he says, now all I have is now to be faithful, to be holy and to shine. I was placed upon the earth to hear the voice of God and to do his will, whatever it is for such a time as this. If you're here this morning and you love and you believe in the providence and the sovereignty of God, and in Acts 20, 17, 26, gets very personal. Well, he says, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation, God determined 2020 for us and determined exactly where our zip codes live, where we all live. As a church saved, set apart, and sent into the world to declare His excellencies in the midst of a pandemic for such a time as this. And here is the world a world that lies in the lap of the evil one, of the spirit that is working in the sons of disobedience, and by nature children of wrath, in a world that is ruled by the prince of the power of the air, in a land that has given themselves over to sensuality and for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness, it's never enough. In the hardness of their heart are being darkened, in their understanding excluded, cut off from the life of God. In a world that lies in deception, decay, and darkness. In a world that will divide, degrade, and disdain one another. There is a worse one in a world that's under judgment and condemnation. Um, what, breaks, what breaks my heart about this list is I forget sometimes who I am and whose I am. I forget. And what makes it hard is how often I want to fight, I want to argue, and I want to debate with this world. And I forget how often I want to play in this world. I 
I understand when the psalmist says, like a dog returning to his own vomit. Right here. So this is for me. This is for me. 2020 has challenged many of us on many fronts. Health has been threatened. Had an uncle just die from COVID a week ago, alone. Financial instability. Our freedom has been challenged. It exposed the frailty of the unity on the social level, on the ecclesial ecclesiastical level, can't even say that. Nevertheless, I really believe this is a gift for, from God to us. This morning, I want us to come a place on a mountaintop with the Lord. If you would please take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, 1 through 16. This is Christ first and greatest sermon which he's ever preached. On, it's called Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon, there is a movement, if you will. In the first nine verses, he begins with the character of the kingdom citizen. He tells him, you have been the blessed of the kingdom you are the blessed, the citizen, the kingdom, the life is in them. Those who are in character and in person have been made, they have been made poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are gentle or meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed, and here's the climax, they shall see God. Blessed, we're called to be the peacemakers. And finally, blessed are those who have been persecuted for righteousness' sake. And then in verse 11 and 12, he, he demonstrates and he shows what, what character reacts and does in the midst of conflict. Again, there's a movement here from character to conflict in here, how it's going to display itself. He says, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say false, falsely say all kind of evil against you. And who knows, they might even cancel you as we enter into the cancel culture. They will ridicule. Hatred, animosity, conspiracy, arrest, silencing the church. All these things. And while we're, while we're fighting and debating masks and no masks, freedom, lockdowns, religious liberty, all this stuff. All this stuff. I'm going to read you a list. And I hope this lays heavy on our hearts this morning. While we're debating this every month. Every month, let these atrocities sink in, please. Mission Network News reports every month, 255 Christians are killed. 104 Christians are abducted. 180 Christian women are sexually violated, harassed, or forced into marriage. These are our sisters. These are daughters. These are mothers and wives at times. 66 churches are attacked. 160 Christians are detained without trial and imprisoned every month. Nobody's crying out social justice for those. Nobody. Verse 12, Christ tells his disciples and us, this is nothing new, you're in good company. They persecuted even the prophets, and they are persecuting our brothers right across the Atlantic from here. And the command is rejoice and be glad, because there is an internal narrative that has overtaken their lives.
for the joy that was set before our Lord, he didn't buckle under the shame of the cross. He didn't buckle for the joy that was set before him. So in the lights, in the light of the trial, conflict, slander, insult, he's going to teach them and us, this is who you are, and this is how you conduct yourself. This is your character applied. If you will, Jesus is moving them and us from the inner character of our quality to a true kingdom citizen, to the outer character, behavior, conduct. So look with me for, our, for verses 13 through 16. That will be our text. I want us to look at two emblems. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Two metaphors, two emblems, very deep, very profound declaration ascribed to the people of Christ and them alone. And I want us to ask two questions this morning. What does it mean to be salt of the earth? What does it mean to be the light of the world in the midst of conflict? And then we want to look at the warning. You are the salt of the earth. Textually, Jesus gets very personal right here. He moved from the third person, they, 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 and them, to you. And, and the Greek here, it, it, is, speaking, it is speaking in this, in this restrictive, precise, direct language, which says, you and you alone, no other, but you and you alone are the salt of the earth. In other words, they and they really, really are the only specific salt, salting factor in the earth. Not only that, the tense expresses a constant condition. He's not saying you're becoming salt or you're getting saltier. He says you are the salt. So whether you're a 10-day-old Christian or a 50-year-old Christian, you are the salt of the earth. These two declarations and emblem establish our identity in the world and for the world. So they're not just for us. They establish our identity, and our identity informs how we function in the midst of conflict. That the, the influence of, of the kingdom descendants are upon this land through us as salt and as light. We've been hearing a lot about the phrase essential. It's going to be going down in history as one of the words of 2020 and 2021. What Christ is saying here is you are and you alone are the essential influencers of the earth and of the land. And if we can add another one to it, you're the only responders in the land, spiritually speaking. And so he shifts from character to influence. First responders, only responders, spiritual responders. So the question for us this morning is, why salt? Why salt? You could have said, you're the honey of the land. You're the sugar of the land. Why salt? Sodium chloride back then and up until a hundred years ago, was the only and the earliest of all preservatives. Without any source of refrigeration, salt became the means of perverse preserving from decay. You could say it is the main antiseptic, if you will. Purifies, it cleanses, it, it preserves from corruption, it retards decay. 
And here we're talking about the land. We're talking about society. We're talking about the world. So salt was so important as a corruption preventative. The ancient world, in the ancient world, wars were fought over salt. Salt could literally make the difference between life and death. One Greek writer said, the meat is dead body and part of the dead body and will, if left to itself, go bad. But salt preserves it. It keeps it fresh. And therefore, like a new soul inserted into the dead body, dead meat left to itself went bad. But pickled, pickled, marinated in salt, it retains its freshness. The salt, he said, seemed to put a kind of life a life. The point is, it preserves from corruption. Not only was it essential, it had such a value. It has such a value. It was valued commodity in the ancient world. Salt was so valuable that it was a form of currency and entire economies were based upon it. It was nicknamed the white gold. Our English word salary comes from the Latin word salarius derived from salt. The Greek called it that divine. The Romans had a jingle in Latin and they said there's nothing more useful than sun and salt. Today, it is estimated there are 14, over 14,000 uses of salt. And just to bring it up to date, I researched what was in a vaccine. And guess what's in the vaccine? Salt. Yeah. Salt goes down better. Liquid salt goes down better than water. They paid soldiers with salt. That's where the phrase is worth his weight in salt. Here's what Jesus is telling us and not telling us. He's not telling us, you as a Christian, you're worth your weight in salt. He's saying you are the salt of the world. Big difference. It's not our value as our effectiveness into the world. Second, he's not saying to us, he says, you're not the salt of the church. You are the salt of the land. You're the salt of the earth. And it's not just a grain. You know how foolish it is to put grain, just a grain of salt on a plate of food? It's the body together. We come out of the salt shaker to salt the earth by its spiritual moral influence. So Christ is not saying you're becoming salt or you're getting saltier. He's saying, remember who you are. You are the salt of the earth. There are two areas I want to bring out in the New Testament for us that deal with salt. If you want to turn with me, Mark 9, 49 and 50. Listen to this. Jesus says, for everyone will be salted with fire, dealing with character, dealing with our character. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will it be? With what, with what will you make it salty again? And then he says, "This have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another." This, it, within its context, he's just coming off saying. Be careful of being a stumbling block or a snare to others, especially young believers. And be careful of snares and stumbling block of yourself. For becomes, the word for there becomes a sense of alertness. Everyone will be salted with fire. Fiery trials are going to come upon us and upon everyone. Trials are needed to season us, to heal us, sometimes to save us from ourselves for the purpose of purification. And so he's saying in the midst of these trials that are going on, be a preservative force in the world. 
Don't be like the world. Be a preservative force. Not a snare to others. Stott says this, When society does go bad, we Christians tend to throw up our hands in pious horror and reproach at the non-Christian world. But should we not rather reproach ourselves? One could hardly blame unsalted meat for going bad, and it cannot do anything else. The real question is to ask, where is the salt? Where is the salt in the world of decay? In a world that's dividing, divisive, dark. When salt is applied, it's rubbed in mysteriously. It dissolves inward. It disappears. It's the inward part. It's the seasoned Christian character, life on life. Not to join in, but to influence in a godly seasoning. One man put it this way, kind of funny. He said, salt of the earth, we're not to be garlic and we're not to be paprika or sugar. We're salt. Salt preserves and fends off decay. Salt heals and soothes. It has a medicinal value. Salt brings flavor and enhances all flavors. Don't you want to be salt? I want to be salt. We're the only living translation. Most men won't read this. They're reading us. They're reading us. He says, have, have salt in yourselves. And watch this. He hints at the unity of the body. And he says, and be at peace with one another. A salt of grain does nothing. Be at peace with one another. Another passage on salt. Turn with me to conduct on one hand, character, and you've got a salted speech. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Many of you know it. At the time Paul wrote this, Christians were called atheists because they served no visible God. They were considered unpatriotic because they would not burn incense to Nero or Caesar, nor will they allow any allegiance in their midst to Nero or Caesar. They never mixed the land's politics with the new way, with the way of Christ, with the kingdom of God. And so he says to them, he says, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders. Be careful how you carry yourself. We need heaven's wisdom here. There's a, there's a spiritual weightiness about us as being the salt of the earth in a land that's decaying and dividing amongst itself. How he says, buying up the opportunity, buying up the time, making the most of the opportunity. Salt, salt becomes emblematic of fidelity and friendship. Redeem the moments. I've had so many unbelievers ask the question, Ray, what do you make of this? The COVID and all this going on. I always go, I'm so glad you ask. I am so glad you ask. And you know what? I, I, my, my answer is always this way. Someone is checking us. We're being checked. How so? And at launch, bringing God into the conversation where he's never been brought in. Verse 6. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. The world is throwing mud at each other, back and forth, back and forth. One side, sorry to say this, the right side tends to be dismissive, defensive, disdainful, defiant, 
the other side is ready to cancel you or call you out. They're done with you. It's like saying you're dead to me. He said, we need winsome wisdom, spiritual tactfulness. There is a passage in John 7, 32. The Pharisees were so done with Christ, hatred. The chief priests sent officers to seize and arrest Jesus Christ. And these officers, probably six to 12 of them, went out to, to, to get arrest Christ. They've heard gossip. They've heard slander about him. They've, they've seen the anger, the hostility. And they went off to arrest him. Twelve verses later, they come back to the chief priest, asked them empty-handed. They said, why did you not arrest him? The soldiers answered by this. Listen to these words. Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. They went to arrest Christ. They were arrested by him and by his words. 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 Words of life. Redemptive time. 2020. 2021. Redemptive time. Don't waste words. Don't be dismissive. Don't belittle whatever the other side might be. Words of life given to us. The world is under judgment and condemnation. They are genuinely scared. They are genuinely worried. And there is fear in the land. Avail yourself. Be a salting salt to them. Pray over your conversations, little or big one. Second thing about salt, it flavors. It flavors. The Greeks nicknamed salt caritas, grace, because it gave a flavor to things. Our speech was, is not to be just common, everyday stuff or corrupt. It must hold back corruption, a thought. A thoughtless word of criticism, a questionable remark, they need salt, not sarcasm. Any angry, dismissive attitude belittling of these could tear down what Christians for years, missiologists tell us these days, it takes 86 church goers a whole year to lead someone to Christ. These are the statistics today. Bring wisdom from above. Pure, peaceable, gentle, gentle. Reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, not according to this world, earthly, natural, demonic. That's what we're seeing outside. That's what's filling the cable news. Natural. Flavor your conversation. Flavor. It's amazing. A little bit of salt on popcorn. It changes everything. Job 6.6. 6, I cannot believe this is in the Bible. Can something tasteless be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? Job needed some salt in his life. It's biblical. Salt your food. Ferguson says, seasoning society is not a matter of being Scrooge-like personalities. He says, whose presence brings a pale of depression and whose entrance marks the exit of joy. On the contrary, the presence of God's people should increase the flavor of life in many different ways. And listen, everything Everything about us should express an attractiveness as well as holiness and purity and the beauty of Jesus Christ in our conversation. So whether we're slowing down decay or enhancing spiritual flavor, God has created us to be a positive impact on this world. And then he goes on, second verse, he says, you are the light of the world. Listen, this is... This is a title that was given to Christ. We're not the source of light, 
Uh, we are called the light of the world. We, are, we reflect light. We transmit light. And he says, and he's saying this to us this morning. You and you alone are the light of the world. Essential, influential to this world. Salt gets in and gets rubbed in into the meat of society. The light comes in and is put up. It shines, it lightens, it exposes darkness, and it points out. It illumines the darkness. Every Christian, every believer becomes an expositor of life. We expose life by the life, by the light of life in the light of the gospel. Philippians 2, 14, you know this passage in 15. Do all things or practice to do all things. Heads the command of this verse, meaning really, really all things. Do all things without grumbling and disputing so that you will prove yourself to be blameless and innocent, unadulterated, literally the word unadulterated, guileless, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as children of light. Piper, Piper commenting on this passage, he says, the reason this passage convicted me so much at the time is because when I grumble, when I grumble is saying there is no better narrative in my soul then this is it, is when we grumble. When the children of light, when the salt of the earth grumble, we lose all effectiveness and we lose our spiritual power to affect the world. Carl Thomas, many of you know who he is, wisely reflects, he says, The church is a secret government of the world, not by bullying or plotting, but by being salt and light. Our influence depends not on favorable historical trends, but on our integrity before Christ. And unfavorable historical trends are not are an ideal settings to display Christ's glory as he himself proved. Listen. No power on earth can withstand the weakness of the cross. BBC, I was reading this week, did a write-up on Christianity. They said two-thirds of Christians in the 2.3 billion Christians in the world live in dangerous neighborhood. They are often poor. They, are, they often belong to an ethnic linguistic and cultural minorities, and they are often at risk. I wonder where the other third lives. Under the most extreme circumstances, I want to move us out of a bubble, out of this American bubble for a moment. Under the most extreme circumstances in Iran alone in 1979, there were only 500 Christians from a Muslim background. Today, there are hundreds of thousands, and the number grows each day. Iranian church leaders acknowledge that political oppression is a key factor in the current openness of the Iranian people. I, I, I asked the guys to put a picture on the, on the monitor for us. Can we get that? Look at this. Is that heaven on earth or what? That is an underground church getting baptized, taken years ago. Is that beautiful? Thank you. While these leaders don't glorify in persecution, they believe God is using it to grow his church. Here's what they say. Every time an Islamic official in Iran says something offensive about Christians, more people seek out someone to tell them about Christ. Welcome it. Welcome it. Jesus, who sits at the right hand of God, is building his church, and the gates of hell 
will not prevail against it. Hell is not on the move. We're on the move. We're on the move. Another passage, John 16, verses 2 and 3. He says, they will make you outcast. And they will do it. They will do it in the name of religion or today social religion or social justice. He says, these things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, he's not saying because they're scribes or they're Pharisees or they're Sadducees or they're Republicans or they're Democrats or they're righties or left. They don't, they do this because they don't know the Father that we know. They haven't tasted mercy and forgiveness and grace and the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts. They'll do this because they don't know the Father. They don't know the Father. Listen, listen. Our role in this year, coming year, to be salt and light, it is to be sent here by God. We are the living, breathing flesh and blood, the common grace of God to our land and our world and our society. There is no other. There is no other. We're it, beloved. We're it. So how we behave and how we conduct ourselves. Here is the warning. There's two of them. Verse 13 of chapter 5, Matthew 5. But if the salt becomes tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. I wrote this a month ago in my Bible. How do we, how does a believer lose his or her saltiness. Sodium chloride, pure sodium chloride salt, does not lose its saltiness unless it's been attached to alkaline or gypsum. It becomes compromised and mixed by other chemicals. Or when it is in the marsh, it is leached out into the ground. It loses that saltiness. It becomes tasteless. I learned a new word this week, insipid, insipid, flavorless, lacking flavor, lacking vigor in our lives. The word tasteless in the Greek is moreno, to lose your savor, flavor, to become tasteless, to be to be a flat Christian. To be, literally, the word means to become foolish or to play the fool. It's used in Romans 1.22, professing or claiming to be wise, they become fools. That's what happens when we're leached out, when we become compromised by the passions and the desires, the politics and the policies of the land, and we lose our effectiveness in this world. Other warning is covering our light, literally snuffing your light. 2020 has exposed a lot, has exposed a lot. Mental, emotional, physical fatigue. Mark Dever of Capitol Hill Church said, One thing it has shown me is how fragile the unity of the body is. Yet we have, I've watched in my own life, people who become with tribal tendencies, combative. That's what tribal, tribalism does, combative. Always suspicious of the other, never trusting, thinking the worst of others. 
believing and spreading conspiracies. Stott again puts it this way. He says, Jesus calls his disciples to exert a double influence on the society, a negative influence by arresting its decay and a positive influence by bringing light into darkness. For it is one thing to stop the spread of evil. It's another thing to promote and spread truth, beauty, and goodness. Let your light shine in such a way that men see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Two days after the election, I sat in a restaurant with two men, happened to be gay. After I said grace and we started eating our meal, um, we talked shop for a while, and I started telling that they knew Nick because he worked with us, and, and they knew he left to Mexico, and he said, how do you guys do this thing? And I started telling him about Southside Bible Church. And then I started telling him about half a dozen of men called the King's Purse here that support people, whether it's on the mission field or Mercy Ministries, Explosion in Lebanon, helping the hungry in Peru, helping the shut-ins in Littleton in our backyard, sending money off to Africa. And he turned to me, one of them turned to me, he said, you don't know what an honor it is for us to work with you. And I said, thank you, Lord, but all honor goes to him, that they glorify the Father in heaven. Eusebius, 314 AD, church historian, first one. He says, from the time when the world was struck by famine and disease, here's how the church Here's how the church came out of it. In this awful adversity, Christians alone gave practical proof of their sympathy and humanity. All day long, some of them tended to the dying and to their burial. Countless number with no one to care for them. Others gathered together from all parts of the city. A multitude of those withered from famine and distri distributed bread to them all so that their deeds were on everyone's lips, and they glorified the God of the Christian. Praise God for that. That is the testimony of the church of Jesus Christ in the third century. I hope and I pray 20 years, 30 years, 50 years from now, our sons and our daughters and our children will say, oh, I watched my mom and dad. I watched our church. I watched our elders give such testimony. Let me ask us a question. This is, I want us to turn to Christ for a moment. What is the most beloved capital or city in the world? Don't answer Parker, Colorado. Okay, do not do that. Council Rock. <laughs> it's a little better. <laughs> but you know the answer. The city of David, Jerusalem. In Matthew 23, I, this was my devotion actually this morning. I was reading through this. Jesus makes this astonishing comment at the end of the chapter. He says, your house is left to you desolate. This isn't longer God's house. This is your house. This is your city. It's not God's city anymore. The social, hypocritical, religious system that was Christless and empty was left to them. Aqaba, the glory of God, was taken out. And then a verse earlier he says, he comes crying, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of a shepherd. He loves their souls. It's like saying, O oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son. 
Same city, same temple. In Matthew 24, the disciples came out and said, look, look at the stone, look at the rocks, look at this massive thing we built for God. And Jesus responds and says, not one of these will be left up on their own. And it's 30 some years later in AD 70, the temple was destroyed. Listen to this. This is history. The most beloved capital in the world during its history, Jerusalem has been attacked 52 times, captured and recaptured 44 times, besieged 23 times and destroyed twice. My application of this, God doesn't owe America anything. God doesn't owe us anything. If his own beloved city of David, Jerusalem, abandoned him, here we have no lasting city, but we seek a city, a new Jerusalem. On a personal level, One day Jesus came into the synagogue. There was a man with a withered hand and the text says they were watching him to see if he would heal him. So they, so they could accuse him. Then the Pharisees and the religious conservatives were literally the custodians of the law. And verse four is very telling. He said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? to save a life or to kill. But there was this chilling, unholy hush. They kept silent. Verse 5, looking around at them with anger. The same word as Revelation 6, the anger of the Lamb. Because they exchanged the love and the mercy of God to man's traditions and they put man's tradition above that and yet it says he looked with, at them with grief at the hardness of their heart what's happening all around us does it grieve us absolutely what's interesting the greek verb in that text he was grieve, he was angry for a moment but his grieving over them over the hardness of their heart, went on and went on and went on. Let's get that heart in us. He brought eternity into the passion of that moment. How do we do this? I want to close with this. I'm so sorry we've gone over. One man says, to live faithfully in the times between the times. In the time between the times, there needs to be this temporal sensibility in our life. How is it done? Not year by year, not month by month, but day by day. One of my heroes of the faith is Don McCurry. Some of you remember at the mission conference, he spoke here a couple of times. This uh, 93-year-old man, spent three civil wars in Pakistan and Iran or Afghanistan, 72 years of marriage, had helped Christians way before 9-11 all over the world. I sat across from him at a lunch table um, a month or two ago. And I asked the question to Don. I said, Don, what, what makes you? What makes you? His answer was not a book. It wasn't a seminar. It wasn't a tape. He said, it is the faithfulness of God by the means of grace day to day. He says, in the word on my knees, and with the people of God. The means of God day after day. So 
When you read your Bible, read Christ into your heart day by day. Keep the eternal narrative. As I close, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come up here, I want to close by praying this passage for us out of Psalm 86 for, for 2021. It's a precious psalm. We bow, bow our hearts together. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Listen to this. Unto unite my heart to fear your name. In other words, give us, give us an undivided heart. And I will give you thanks that we may reverence you. We may reverence you in all circumstances. And we give thanks with all our heart. I will if overflow with gratitude and thanksgiving for us and will glorify your name forever. Why? For your loving kindness towards us and towards us here is great. What a precious prayer. All, all to the glory. All to glory be to God. Amen.